So hello, Mr. Carter, and it's really nice to have you here. Um, thank you for taking the time in your busy schedule to talk to with us about the amazing work that you do. So I have Hannah here from the Ian Froshan pod to talk with you today. So Hannah, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Hannah. I am the publishing manager with the organization. So I've been putting together our monthly newsletters. So I was interested to meet you as well and learn more about what you do. Perfect. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, and I have to apologize for running a bit late with with everything. It was just uh, there's been a confluence of things because I'm I'm both an illustrator for my work, but also work with the American Station Society. Uh, we're right in the midst of working on a conference, so there's a lot of stuff bombarded with me. Then I had a family issues back in Holland, so <laughs> but it's been interesting. So thanks for having me. I know with the um, um, and I, I said it mentioned earlier, um, Eon, I just, I'm just blown away by what you've done with the organization. It's been a number of years. I can't remember when it was the last, was it 2018? Was that yeah. right? Like four years ago. And of course we throw the pandemic in there and everybody has a different sense of time nowadays. So everything is measured in pre pandemic and post pandemic. And so uh, it's incredible to see you. I have also been watching you or your musical talents. It's incredible. And then to see what you've done here with your organization. So uh, anyway, uh, let me know if you have any specific questions for me or whatever, what it pertains to illustrations or anything else that's to the oceans. <laughs> so I think we can. So we have a list of questions. So I sure. think we can go to our first question. So. My first question is, what can you tell us about your educational background? Oh, my goodness. Well, first of all, I was born in Holland, Netherlands, uh, in a town called Arnhem, close to the German border. Uh, my life has changed drastically, very difficult. I had, um, I became a ballet dancer, uh, a classical ballet dancer. So that's something entirely different from what the work that I'm doing currently. Um, but being a ballet dancer it's an uh, ephemeral existence what that i mean with that is a, it's a short career much much like being an athlete so you can it's very physical so you can only do that for a short time so you get into your that sort of mid to late 30s and you really have to start thinking about a career transition very much like football players you name it um so that's what i did too so then i became an illustrator uh something that my dad used to be an illustrator and painter and so I followed in his footsteps at that point. Um, and then a long time short, I got married in Switzerland through an American girl, moved to the United States, to Canada, to the United States. And now since uh, since I stopped dancing and transitioned to an illustrator, a scientific illustrator, uh, and dealing mostly with uh, marine mammals, that's the whales, dolphins, and porpoises, the cetaceans, and uh, but also pinnipeds, uh, the the seals and sea lions, uh, drawing um, things sort of anatomy, uh, astrophysiology, uh, all kinds of aspects with uh, with whales and dolphins, and some conservation issues as well. So it's been really fun, and along the way, I've been a lot of people. It's not a very long answer here, but <laughs> yeah, thank you. Sure. I think Hannah has the next question. Okay. So. Your career as a scientific and natural history illustrator sounds very unique and interesting. Could you tell us a little bit about what it is you do? Sure. Uh, well, I first, when I started my, because uh, I took some courses, I always, always liked drawing and illustrating. I, I had, from, like for my dad, I took that. I always loved drawing pictures, drawing animals. And um, so when I stopped dancing, I didn't immediately see myself as an illustrator, but my love for whales and uh, was always there. Um, and of course, moving to the Pacific Northwest near Seattle, we have killer whales, we have whales, we're humpback whales now. We have lots of whales and marine mammals around us. So that that love for marine mammals was fueled again. So then I took courses uh, around here, a different school of visual concept in Seattle, a school of realist arts. Um, but then over time, then I joined an organization called the American Cetacean Society in 2001. And then I really make that click, and I thought something I maybe use illustrations and work on scientific illustrations. So, um, and with that meaning is that you have to be. Um, I'm, I'm not so concerned whether the drawings are doing as art, an art form necessarily, but that they have um, working with scientists very uh, closely, 
um, particularly if I've done and recently I've done some books on on anatomy. So you have to work with scientists, and we want to show certain. Uh, you want to show the the. Um, Either show the bone structures, the skeleton, or you show some of the the um, some of the insides, and and um, whether that's the cir the circulation or muscles, and you have to show that and draw that, and and that's interesting. I mean, that's kind of what I do, but also just show the animal as it is. Uh, when I draw a whale, it's kind of strange. It's because in a way, I take it's almost like taking the whale out of the water and toweling it off, and that's how I draw it. So it's not drawing it underwater. I don't have underwater scenes. You try to draw the, as accurate as possible the animal um, that way. Because most of the times, if, if you look at whales or dolphins, you only see part of it. You see a dorsal fin, or if you're lucky enough, you see the whole whale or dolphin jumping out of the water. But you don't always see the entire animal what it looks like. So you. It's almost what I do then is take the animal almost out of the water and show it what it actually looks like and then try to uh, working with uh, scientists and the exact measurements. So you have to. So it's it's very nerdy, <laughs> but that's OK. Yeah, hope it answers. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, so my next question is, as a child, I mean, you touched on this a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Did you have any like specific passions or interests that led you to become a, nat a natural illustrator? Yeah, as I said, so a drawing, I always liked that. So um, my fascination has been always as a boy, I was fascinated by a lot of other things. But animals was always, uh, always there in my life because my parents uh, instilled sort of a uh, an appreciation for nature. We always went out in the in the forests, and so um, I grew up with. We, you know, you had uh, my dad always knew everything about plants, and so what you can point out to a little that plant is this and that, and and animals, and uh, so I grew up with that. And I think that's very important that if your parents instill this this sense and wonderment for nature, then that sort of rubs that rubs off on you. I'm sure you had the same thing, uh, Ian. You so you love nature. It doesn't come about. You have oh, you read books. So yeah. bit by bit, I wrote about that. So you, you're starting to read books and it just become fascinated. Yeah, and another aspect of even um, some of the ones, the first dolphins and whales I've saw were actually in an, an oceanarium in, in Holland, in Harte Wijk. It was a, as an aquarium. My views have a little bit changed on how we look at animals in captivity or in managed care, as it is called now. So to have been, my views have, but I have to be honest that so my my first um, the first time I've seen a dolphin or a whale, a killer whale in in captivity, that sort of sparked also something in me. Uh, however, my views on that has a little bit changed. But that's a, I know that's a whole different topic. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, that's sort of where the love comes from then. And scientific illustration is something that. I like anatomy. That's something that I always certainly as a dancer, you have to be aware of anatomy, you know, have to well, how muscles work. And so that's another interest. So, yeah. That hope that answers that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, to some okay. degree. So, that's okay. really cool. Sure. OK, so the next question is, could you share some challenges you face when creating your illustrations? Yeah, it is because there is um, if you compare to and I'll ignore that phone going off here, um, but if you compare the illustration, uh, if you compare the um, um, whales, dolphins, porpoises, the cetaceans, if you compare it to other uh, mammals, um, it, there's there's far less known about marine mammals and particularly whales than it is terrestrial mammals or land mammals. So there are more photos. You can actually, for a lamb, you can even go to a zoo and look at animals, observed animals. And that's much more difficult. As I mentioned earlier, You sometimes you go whale watching. Some people have asked me, just, well, Uko, uh, so you take your sketchbook on the on a whale watch boat and then start drawing them? Like, no, you don't see much from a whale. So I have to use a lot of photos. I have to use um, stranding data, sometimes data from whalings, uh, old whaling operations. You can see sizes and they have um, all the proportions. So um, so I get all that information from there. So it's it's not something I can go out on a boat and with my sketchbook and start drawing. So that's impossible. Yeah. You don't see much of the of a whale of a dolphin. So um, I need a look. I look at a lot of photos and and I and scientists send me lots and lots of photos um, and and videos. You look to see how an animal moves. That helps you too. So, um, yeah. So bit by bit, you're 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 getting more information. But it's it is more difficult. So it's not something like you can go to a zoo or 
um, and, and observe the animal and then you can draw it from there. I, I love that too. I used to take my sketchbook to the, to the local zoo here in Seattle and, and start drawing animals, but I can't do that with whales and dolphins. So that's a challenge. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So my next question is, have there been any special or like notable moments in your career? Yeah, um, it took me a long. It took me at least uh, at least a decade or so to sort of establish myself and and got a little bit of a name out there. Uh, it's been trial and error, but it's basically. And this is something that is actually a take home message for everyone: is that you um, the personal the personal connections are immensely important. So what I mean with that is, if you I went to um, marine mammal. Uh, um, conferences and I actually met with uh, scientists and some of them I had put in high esteem and I put them on a pedestal I think oh they're gods they're amazing people you find out later on they're actually just human beings and they love to talk to you and so you may over time you make the connection so this is something that is basically take away from from anything in your life is because we're so wrapped up in our phones and and uh, doing every right now we're doing stuff online, but the personal connections that we have, and that's why Iana was wonderful to meet you back in 2018. Those personal connections are incredible, uh, and I still are. And of course, it's difficult during a pandemic, but those are kind of things. Yeah, and then it's all that networking resulted in some some wonderful collaborations. We're working on a on a book, and we're working on a on another edition right now. Is the uh, the marine mammals of the world it's um an identification guide so that'll be about 400 drawings so we're redoing the whole thing again uh updating it because the taxonomy how the animals are classified has changed um but they're also new we know no amount more about whales even since then beaked whales there's even a couple of new uh whale species that have been described since since even since you since we talked uh eon there's now a new beaked whale it's called sato's beaked whale it's a it's part of a it's kind of like a beard speak well, but it's smaller, it's darker. So it's a new species. Um, so we have a couple of newer. Also, we now uh, a couple of big twelves. We have a little bit more information of what they really look like because we only knew them from strandings. And when a whale or a dolphin strands, they often uh, this postmortem darkening, which means that in animals, it doesn't it's sort of starting to decompose very quickly. So the coloration and what the animal exactly looks is is um changes very quickly and so if you have a photos from stranding photos it doesn't quite show what what a, what the animal looks like in in life so we know a lot more even in just the last last year so that's a wonderful publication i like and um and we work and of course i mentioned earlier that book on on anatomy on uh, the anatomy of dolphins that was a wonderful work to work and also work with the scientists yeah yeah, we have the first edition of the Marine Mammals of the World book, and I'm looking forward to the yeah. publication of the next second It'll edition. It will be uh, 2024, 20, so we're looking at the publication dates. It probably should coincide with the, um, there's a Marine Mammal Biennial Conference in Perth, Australia. So hopefully we're having it coincide with that time, so it'll be released. And, and hopefully the taxonomy of dolphins haven't changed or whales haven't changed again because then we're the moment you publish it things are already uh, out of date in a sense but we're trying to uh, so that's an immense work so that'll be fun cool do you have a favorite part of your job yeah actually favorite part is actually um is working with people because Illustrating is a very lonely existence. I'm just sitting here in my office here during drawing. I don't have, it's not collaborative. So it's not, oh, it is collaborative with scientists, but um, the actual drawing process I do myself, but but networking with scientists uh, is wonderful. I don't always, sometimes I'm lucky to see them in Seattle. I can actually have a coffee with someone and, and talk to them um, or again, and consult some of the NOAA Fisheries has a great, a wonderful library. There's another library here on marine mammals also close by. So it can kind of network and collaborate. And um, yeah, and that's also one of the reasons I joined the American Cetacean Society, because I knew this was going to be a very lonely existence uh, mm -hmm. being an illustrator. So I wanted still the people connection. I still wanted the So that was one of the reasons I joined the American Cetacean Society. So yeah, those, the personal connections are some of my favorite things, actually. And of course, yeah, drawing, of course, too, yeah. Yeah. Yep, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. So my 
Next question is like, what are some of the tools that you use to create the cool illustrations? Okay, it's a very good question. Um, that is actually when I went to art school here after my dance career. So they were very adamant that I, they said, no, you will not use computers. Don't use computers. You have to, so I have to do it with oil. Uh, you do all kinds of medium you work with just with your hands and, and doing drawing, model drawing. But yeah, once I started doing the illustration work, I found that I really like the, the computer. It has, uh, it's, it's not an, it's not an alternative to real drawing with a hand or a pen or paper and, and, and a pencil uh, or a brushes. Uh, it doesn't have that immediacy and it doesn't have the spontaneity, but to be exact and to be working very exactly on a, on a computer helps because I can make changes constantly. I can build in layers. So I work with Adobe Illustrator. It's a vector program. Uh, I'm not sure if you know what a vector program is. It's basically is, yeah, it's you have, it's other than, um, if it's a non-vector, it's it's you're like Photoshop. Everything is pixelated, all pixels. But in vector, you can actually really um, make this uh, really large illustrations. Like um, you can you can blow them up to any invention. You don't have to worry that stays the same, so the resolution stays the same. So I use a vector program, uh, the Adobe Illustrator. And then I'll bring a little bit. I do as much as I can there, and then I'll bring it into Photoshop, and I'll. There on hand, so I can do some highlights, or I can build fading. I can do some washes on it, and so make some changes. But I often, and that's something you talked about earlier. So, what are some of the the things you don't like, or what are the challenges? The challenges is to redo something. To say, you know, I'll I'll be very happy, and I'm I'm showing an illustration to a scientist, and and I'm like a happy, and then they say. Well, it's nice, but could you do? Could you make the changes? And I'm like, oh no, I have to do it all over again. So, reverting back to the Illustrator file, the vector file is makes it so much easier that I can kind of make changes. I can kind of make small changes and alterations. So I don't have to redo the whole. If you were to do this in oil or in and worse in in watercolor, you'd be like you'd. Toss that out, and you have to start all over again. You cannot make the changes. It's very difficult to do. So those are the the, the pros on working uh, with the uh, these uh, digital format. Of course, you don't have a painting. Once you're painting, you have something tangible. You have something. I have it in. It's on my computer. It's not a. I don't. I can't hang it up. I, of course, I can print it out and and hang it up that way. But so yeah, it's very different. Different art form. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a certain step or process of steps that you follow to create an illustration? Yeah, so if I draw a whale, I'll I'll start with the actually most much of the process is not so much creating the illustrations. It's for me getting all the information. That means mm -hmm. I have to gather all the photos and or videos that, that scientists sent me off to gather as much as I information I can get. I have uh, behind me, you can see an enormous library that's all, all marine mammal books from all of. So I have a lot of libraries, a lot of stuff here I can. I don't have to go to a library somewhere else, but I have a lot of stuff here myself so I can look in books. They have usually measurements of the whales um, from stranding data or on, uh, all, all the other information that is necessary for me to, to make the illustrations. So I'll, in, in Illustrator, I can start just an outline illustration um, and I'll kind of proportion out the whale, where the dorsal fin is, what's the length between the dorsal fin and the, and the the tip of the snout and these kind of things. I'll have to measure that out. And um, uh, sometimes, like if it's so good, you can actually you can even put the the. Uh, I have a couple of illustrations where I put the the skeleton in there too, so you can kind of see where the proportion is already in there too. So that's a whole process for me, just to try to be as exact as possible. But whales and dolphins are just like humans. We're we all. We're not all one shape and size, so humans come in all shapes and sizes too. So it's very difficult to say what is a. You try to have an a, create an animal that is representative for the entire species, and let's say bottlenose dolphin, and boy, is somehow, uh, yeah, that could that could change. Uh, um, yeah, but that's one. That's part of the process anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um... I think like we lost. Yeah. <laughs> we lost Hannah there somehow. <laughs> um, I can ask the next question. Um, sure. I'll yeah. Can see, well, we can wait a few minutes. Um, oh, that's fine too. To see, um, but in the meantime, I can ask the next question. Um, so, sure. 
Like I've used your World of the Whales poster in many of my presentations and it makes it so much easier for the audience to understand the content much better. So sure. do you create any other projects that could create awareness in the marine life? Um, yeah, I will be actually, um, the next thing I'll be working on since I'm working on the illustrations for the next version book. So um, no official, we're working probably with really Nora Fisheries once the, Right now, I'm doing all the beaked whales, the zivitis. Those are the most enigmatic. It's it's the most um, it's a group of whales that we know so little about. They live offshore in very deep water, and um, there's probably about uh, so there's about yeah, well, it's, little, it, it's a still interesting diversity of beaked whales that we have. And they and they're very large. Some of them are. Um, I think Hanno's back again too with us. So some of these whales. Are quite large, like beard beak dwell to a smaller one. So we're working on a poster with the uh, NOAA Fisheries. Once that's done with these big dwell illustrations, we're working on a poster. Um, and yeah, then I'll work with a couple of scientists on the reproductive uh, anatomy of, of dolphins. That's a whole different thing. We're hoping to do some kind of poster to do with, with um, uh, but probably have some big behavior, but we don't know yet. That might be a little bit of along the road, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of conservation-related uh, posters. That's something would be nice to to work with. Um, so I'm hoping something down the road will be like that. Usually, it's all basically either anatomy stuff or how the animal looks from the, from the outside, or looking at the diversity, like the whales in the world post that I created. Is it it shows it's a wonderful way to show the diversity of of all the cetaceans, the whales, dolphins, and porpoises. So. We'll do that with the beaked whales and with a little bit more information um, because it is a uh, group of animals we know so little about. So that I think it's important to to sort of share that with the public, just kind of because there's so little out information. There's only one book ever written about beaked whales, so it's that tells you everything. <laughs> there's lots of books <laughs> about killer whales. I have so many books about orcas, but there's only one book about about beaked whales. <laughs> Actually, it's so bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Let me know if you have any other questions for me. Uh, I think Anna has the next question. Okay, were you just talking about the Whales of the World poster? Okay. Yeah, it's just basically what kind of the posters and the project that I created and was there any other projects that I am working on that that solely that deals with either conservation or. Um, yeah, and solely okay. there. Yeah, and our, our obviously our um, American Cetacean Society conference will deal with a lot of it's the that'll deal a lot with conservation and work. We're, we're getting scientists come in talking a little bit about um, the Fakita, that's the the endangered critically endangered porpoise in in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, in the Gulf of uh, California, excuse me, or the Sea of Cortez, as also called. So, yeah. and and other uh, endangered species like the Atlantic humpback dolphin is probably the next dolphin. And a lot of Southeast Asia has a lot of dolphins that have coastal um, or river dolphins, like in Southeast Asia too, that that have that are um, endangered. And and obviously there's a lot of human pressure. So so that's something I'm working on. Well, that'd be nice actually working on a poster. I was hoping to do that. So I'm hoping to work with someone actually on that. But but that's all. Maybe if, in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Well, our next question then was approximately how long does it take you to complete one drawing? Um, and again, yeah, that is that is difficult. So if I have a lot of information on a species, if I have a lot of drawings and, and then I can draw that very quickly. Anatomy takes a little bit longer because uh, to see what we want to draw and um, so that's it's a little a little trickier um, that can take for some of the anatomical drawings they can take uh, they can take up to a week or more or a couple of weeks even much of the time is actually more spent on for me gathering all the information and doing battling all the research in other libraries or here um, so it could take a couple of weeks and sometimes I can actually do an illustration in a day so it it's it really depends on the on the complexity of of the illustration so. Yeah. <laughs> are there different types of scientific illustrations? Yeah, there are in a way. There's, of course, there's medical illustrations. Uh, that people are doing medical illustration that is basically working. Then you're, and that could be human anatomy. Um, anything to do with the illnesses. Sometimes you have to. 
draw very difficult con conceptual drawings that have to do that are, that are very small. And I'm doing that right now also for um, some guys working in, in cancer research, actually, in, in uh, Raleigh Durham. Um, so working actually, that's something away from whales, although it has some implication because it really deals with the environment and plastics in the ocean and what it does to our bodies and also to the to animals in the world. So that's something I'm working on right now. So that's actually some of the conservation issue. But these are very kind of more schematic illustrations and uh, basically show um, where how plastics are made, what it does to the environment, what does it do to um, and how, when we throw these plastics and, and, and trash away, what it does for the environment, what it does to, to developing countries, how the, how the um, uh, um, you know, it's basically giving a, a much more of an overview and more schematic and, and um, trying to visually communicate with people the complexity of some of these issues. Yeah, so I have a follow-up question to that. Sure. So, um, yeah. Like, what are the differences and similarities between like the creation of these different types of illustrations? Um, well, it's it's easier to put as nice when you draw and when I draw a dolphin or a whale, just the external view. It's just that's but I can put a little bit more um more more of my art and more uh, I kind of try to it's more of um. It's kind of more fun for me to draw that way too, because you you can put a little bit of shading in there. Uh, you can give it a little bit more of an artistry in there too. Of course, they're never they're not meant to be photos, but that's something you can work with. If you get down to um, to some of the animals anatomy and um, or some of the conceptual drawings, it's it could be a little bit more tricky. Um, so there's a very different approach to to illustrating, uh, but that depends on on your collaborator of nature and how you work with science and what they want to communicate. So for me, it's sometimes it's difficult to be exactly on the same page with the scientists, and we're all very much like here. I'll be doing that in Zoom. I'll talk to them because I can't. Some of them are too far away. Some of them in Europe or in in Asia or or, or but even not in my area. So I still have to communicate that way. So the the, the illustrations can be can be very um. Yet a process can be very different for each. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, question. <laughs> yeah okay. thank you. Okay. So I have the next question. So like what can kids do to prepare for like a career in natural history and scientific illustrations from elementary school through college? OK, um, well, Regardless of whether you're going to be an, an, an scientific illustrator or doing anything with art, um, I think it's good to develop those skills anyway. I think the once you become an illustrator or an artist, uh, uh, actually during, just just being drawing it even at home as a, as a child too, um, it, it can help how you observe things in, in your um, in the world around you. So I think that helps you already. So. And that's regardless of whether you um, really want to, to to become an illustrator or an artist down the road. So I think having the skills is already very important. So even for scientists and uh, biologists who work in the field, I think it's good to have already those skills anyway. Um, to become an illustrator, a scientific illustrator, you can. There are some courses. I think there's a wonderful one in Santa Cruz. They had. Uh, I'm not aware of all the schools that do scientific illustration, but in Santa Cruz, I think the university there, Santa Cruz, has a uh, wonderful program. It's been well known as well established. There's one here at the University of Washington in Seattle. I think I'm still going on. I think I have. I'm not quite sure. Um, there might be some other ones around too. Some colleges and universities that have it. I'd have to. I'm not. I'm not completely aware of it. Uh, uh, to be honest, recently, I didn't use any of the schools. I went to regular art schools and then I sort of hone into the craft uh, a little bit trial and error over time. And then there's a there's even a guild, I think, for scientific illustrators. So you can look that up. So you have more information and that can help you, too, with questions about what should I charge for illustrations or um, it's anything that deals with arts and science. It does not make a whole lot of money. So. If you want to be, a, it's 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 richly and rewarding for because it is wonderful work you do. You love to do it. It's not so. You, if you like to make money, that's obviously not the kind of work you should be doing. But 
um, it should be doing it because you love it. And uh, if you can make some money out of it, that's great. Or maybe you can combine it with another career like scientists or biologists could could also hone in their skills to uh, as an illustrator can help them um, with obser observing animals, observing uh, the world around them. Does that answer yeah. <laughs> to you? Yeah. Thank you. Um, sure. I also have the next question. So what advice do you have for aspiring scientific illustrators? You kind of covered it a little, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, this, it goes back to, well, first of all, you have to have a lot for animals or plants or whatever you want to do. So you could be a botanical illustrator. You mentioned it earlier, so you asked me what kind of illustrators are there. There's medical illustrators, also botanical illustration. You're just doing plants and um, or what I do in animals or anatomy or conceptual illustration, anything that has to do with natural history or science. Um, first of all, I think you, you you can certainly check in with the the guild for the national for uh, for the scientific illustrators, and they have advice as well on their website. I think GNSCI, I think it's .org, I believe. I'm not I'm not off the hand. I'm gonna be able you be able to Google that nowadays easily. Um, then, of course, as I said earlier, personal connections. If you have, let's say, if you are an, want to become a scientific illustrator and you want to, let's say, I want to do illustrations just on mammals or birds, I just want to do bird illustrations, then you join the Ottoman Society or you join something, an, an, an illustration, or a, you, you join a, an organization that deals with that specific topic. So, and in my case, too, I joined the Society for Marine Mammalogy. I joined the American Cetacean Society. And from there on, you build up your, your network, too. And then you're basically, you're so bold, and you just email them and, and later call the scientists. And, and, um, and you'd be surprised how wonderful and how gracious they are in helping you, because um, they like to hear, they like to work with an illustrator as well. So, But it's taken, over, it's taken time. It's, it just doesn't happen in one day. But again, it comes down to personal connections. You have to build the connections, and that's that goes with anything in life. Yeah, thank you. Um, sure. And um, so, basically, is there anything else you would like to say? Or I no, well, as to my job here, um, no, I, I encourage anyone to, 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 if you have the drawing skills, if you like to, to draw, that's something you like, to, you like animals, and uh, why not give it a chance? Um, again, you can combine it with anything else. So, um, so I encourage anyone to do that. So uh, try it. Uh, if it doesn't work, you still, it's not lost. If you have those drawing skills, you still have the love for drawing. You don't have to make your uh, occupation out of it. It'd still be nice to do it. So um, I'd say go for it. Um, pertaining to, uh, again, I'll have to, uh, to say too, but your organization, uh, Aeon, it's just uh, wonderful to see what you guys are doing. You can show us that how even one person like you can make a difference and then start, start something, get the ball rolling, which is amazing that, uh, cause you're incredible how much, um, even one person can do to make a difference. Even if it's a small, you may say, oh, I, I, my contribution to all of this is so small and insignificant, but that even if you have, if you have, it's just a few people that you inspire. And that's something worth hoping with my too, that I, I hear sometimes from people how my work inspired them to do something. That's so whether that's what you do here, Eon, in, in your organization or uh, what I do here as an illustrator or what I do as, as my volunteer <laughs> position as president of the American Cetacean Society, it's something that you hope that you inspire some other people to do it and to kind of um, kind of pay it forward basically just making sure that other people pick up on that and continue that so continue the process so that's that's all i have to say here for now but thank you yeah. um and one last thing since sure. oceans day is coming up um yep. would you like to share a special message to the community for the world oceans day yeah, World Oceans Day. It is. It is. Our planet is uh, is almost mostly uh, made up out of oceans. So water is is uh, it's so important to life. And uh, whether it's fisheries, the fish that we eat, the seafood, it's um, we like to swim in it. We like to have clean beaches. But it's something. Anything that actually even we do on land has repercussions. Uh, um, everything that we, uh, if you're, you know, you're any. 
anyone who's actually changing their oil in the in front of the driveway, all of that water, everything ends up in our oceans, which is our lifeblood. It's just our life. It sustains us, all of us. So it's impossible that we it's a, it's so important for us to to take care of that. And I think that is the take home message that we take care of environment and take care of our oceans. Uh, love it, uh, enjoy it, and I think um, that's something that you you guys do at uh, at your organization here, Eon. Uh, we do that, try to do that into, with the American Cetacean Society. So, love our oceans and then take care of it. You love you love what you uh, you take care of what you love. So that's so important. Yeah. Thank you. And the yeah. message from Eon for Ocean is to. Um, basically requesting people to take our common sense plastic pledge, which is like saying that you won't use, you won't use single use plastics and so on and so forth. And also like um, it's on our website, so you can go there and take it today. <laughs> Absolutely. Perfect. That's that's a wonderful. And thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. So it's really fun to talk to you. Yeah. Thank you for being here. And also yeah. thank you, Anna, for being here for the interview. Yes, thank, thank you, Anna. Thank you. Good. And if you need anything else from me, just let me know. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Good.